right here. Dad was a farmer, but he was a carpenter too, and he worked out for many years, and he'd come home and have supper, and then he'd sit on the tractor till I don't know how long to do the farming too, and he worked very hard. What did you guys grow? Well, we had the normal stuff, the wheat, oats, and barley. Dad started out with a 1530 McCormick Deering tractor and with steel wheels yet, I remember it being sold. He was mechanically inclined and so was I and uh, got out of uh, school and I started collecting old cars and they were American stuff and that was basically how I got started in antique cars. My first car, well dad bought my first car, was a 51 Plymouth. And I drove to school the last year, the last summer, I drove to school till winter. The neighbor had an old uh, 25 Chrysler touring car, sat in the bush and I dragged it home too. And I was going to restore it. I started on it, but no heat. Well, I joined the Edmonton Antique Car Club in 62. And uh, at the uh, one meeting in 1967 in April, the president, Nestor Marchition said, you know, there's a Rolls Royce for sale in town. And I said, I know nothing about Rolls Royce. He said, well, you go and see Art Southwark. He has one. So I made an appointment to see him and he was selling Mutual Life of Canada on Jasper Avenue in the corner office. And uh, he said, well, you have to see my mechanic, Albert DeBleek. So I made an appointment with him to come over to the car, it was in a little one-car garage in a back alley. And Albert came over Sunday morning with a pair of coveralls and a stethoscope. And that was it. The first time we drove it about 25 miles and it was fine. And the next time we drove it was to the museum. Hmm. So it's a good car, it still is. Well, I didn't decide I needed more. What happened, Art Southworth and I would uh, drive to uh, uh, the antique car club meetings in his Rolls Royce. And uh, it was in winter when he decided that he wanted to sell this. And that was a 1957 or 58 Silver Cloud One. And uh, that was in 1980, after 81 anyway, I was working for Canadian General Electric and he came over with the car in the middle of winter and he said let's go for a ride so we did and it was nice and warm and i thought wow this is pretty nice but uh, he wanted a fair bit of money and, and i didn't have that much money and so i was looking at a bentley which was less money but then as i got into conversation with art he said well it's using oil about a liter a day and he was using it in his business every day, calling on customers. And I thought, well, it needs an overhaul, so the price was better than the Bentley. The Bentley was a very nice car, but it was more money than the Rolls Royce, but I still wanted the Rolls Royce. So I bought the car, brought it home, and I went through the car, and what I found, it had sided exhaust valves, so I took the inspection plates off the side and here there was pieces of gasket missing and what was happening while the car was running the oil was splashing against the uh, the uh, plates or the you know the oil that was lubricating the engine and it was running out and so I replaced the gasket covers gaskets on the covers and it didn't need an oil change uh, an overhaul sorry so what was what was the moment when you decided to start collecting different types of Rolls Royces to build your collection up? Well, that happened when uh, we had uh, an international antique car meet in Edmonton, and there was a beautiful silver wraith, green and yellow, that uh, was there, and the banker had it there, and he was wanting to sell it, and I saw it, and it was gorgeous. And uh, I talked to him, and it turns out that they had repossessed it, and it was for sale, and that's why I brought it to the meet to show everybody. And he wanted quite a bit of money, but I said, well, that's beyond me, but 
I went to an international antique car, well, the Rolls-Royce National Meet in California. I saw some cars similar to that, and they were worth quite a bit more than this. So when I came back, I phoned the banker, and he said, well, we've decided to send it down to the States to a big museum, or an auction sale, so if you are interested, you better come by on Sunday. So I went over and looked at it, turned the key and it started right up. I thought, well, maybe this isn't so bad. So I made an offer and he said, oh, we've had higher offers than that. I said, well, that's the most I can offer. So the next day they had the meeting apparently and I got a phone call and they said, the car is yours. Well, that started the collection because I thought, three Rolls Royces. I can't tell anybody about three Rolls Royces. What did your dad think of all this, the collecting? Well, he wasn't into antique cars, so he just thought, well, it's a nice hobby, and that was all. He never drove one. Uh, I think I've taken him for rides in them, but never was very excited about the car. It, tell me about the collection you've built right now. How many cars do you have? In the collection. Well, at the present time, I have 23 Rolls Royce and Bentley cars. I have two Bentleys and a rolling chassis that's Bentley, and the rest are all Rolls Royce. So now that you've put this museum together, and we're going to have a chance to go visit that later on, yes. but what are what are your hopes for the legacy of this collection? What what do you hope will happen with it? Well. I built a museum building at the Duke West Antique Society. I've been a member since it started. And eventually, I think we will donate the cars to the Duke West and uh, to, to promote tourism. A collection like this is uh, pretty valuable in attracting people. It's the only collection of this size in Canada. It's the most comprehensive. And uh, it should attract people from all across Canada and various parts of the world. So some people watching at home might think, well, why not sell everything and just spend every day on the beach with a drink in your hand for the, <laughs> from now until the end? Um, what would you say to those people who don't understand people that build a collection like this? Well, I'm not one to sit around, so I'd go crazy sitting on the beach. That would last two or three days and then I'd be looking around for something to do. So this keeps me busy all the time, winter and summer, uh, here on the farm. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, and so I don't get to work on the cars uh, as much as I'd like to, but uh, I've retired. I sold my business in, in uh, oh, a few years ago, 10 years ago anyway. And uh, I've devoted full time to the cars and to the farm. A lot of my friends are car people, and through the Edmonton Antique Car Club, uh, that's how I've met most of the people in the car fraternity. I, I belong to the Rolls-Royce Owners Club, and I've gone to the national meets in the U.S. and Canada. We had one in Calgary. And I belong to the uh, Rolls-Royce Enthusiast Club in England, plus uh, various uh, regions. I belong to the B.C. region. I go out there every year with a car to a meet that they have. And uh, we have various events here in Alberta. We're spread out so far between Calgary and Edmonton. There's uh, Rolls Royce owners there and here. We meet sort of in Red Deer sometimes. And we'll have events in, in the Edmonton area and they have events in the Calgary area to keep the enthusiasm up. So, I have a fly in breakfast once a year, <coughs> and this year, this past year, September is my birthday, we had 250 people out and about 30 airplanes. Out of that, there was eight helicopters come in. We had 13 cars come out, vintage cars. Uh, there's probably 10 of them were Rolls Royce and Bentley. And we had a brand new uh, Rolls Royce Ghost out and uh, one of our members owns it, it's a, a 2021. And he brought it out here too, for display. And uh, so that's how we enjoy life here. Sounds very social. <laughs> very social, yes. Yes, we, uh, 
we uh, have quite a few people flying in. We have airplanes that are kept here in the hangars. And so there's always something going on. Well, what's your cat's name? Kitty. Oh, that seems appropriate. <laughs> and he's a very people-oriented person. Just to know that I still love him. And then he's okay. He'll come and put his paws against the window, which you can see. Yeah, right there. <laughs> In January, we had this much good weather. How should that be? We're very lucky. <laughs> well, from the fellow that thought the building that it was a factory. We were just saying not many people have their own air traffic control tower on their farm. <laughs> well, look at this. So what type of aircraft are we looking at here? This is a 1946 air group and the Air Research Corporation. And uh, this was uh, built from 46, I think, till about uh, 60, in the 60s, 64, 66, I think. And uh, I bought this as my first airplane. And it's been a very good airplane. I've put on a few hundred hours on it. I try to fly it every weekend, but lately that hasn't happened. So you'll hop in this and go grab coffee in a different town or? Yes, I'll fly down to Macomb mostly. And we have coffee there and I visit with everybody and then I fly back home. Huh. Now, did you put yourself like a, a little fold up bicycle or something in there or no i i had one and i was going to use it but it's pretty small and i don't uh, uh take off from the airport when i land there i uh, go somewhere else off the to the town or something but uh i don't need a bicycle somebody will take me up if i want to. there you go yeah. well it's a very pretty looking plane all polished up well it needs polishing again it's, uh, <laughs> It was polished, but it could stand another one. Oh, I see. You've got a, a limousine. A limousine. And uh, it's a 36 inch stretch. What year is this? This is a 1986, I believe. Yeah, it's still really luxurious on the inside. Oh, well, it was uh, done by Jankel. And if Jankel built it, Rolls Royce would actually warranty it. Most people, if they had their car stretched, they would put a vinyl roof on to hide the welds, but you could see it's painted and there's no... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I never noticed that before because they were nervous about the body work that they'd done. That's right, yes. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Kitty? Your cat is trying to go for a ride in your car here in the he Bentley. Wants, he loves cars. He gets inside the cars all the time. Well, well, I guess with a cat like that around, you don't have to worry about mice so much. No, no, not too much. Wow. And so what year is this Bentley? This is a 53 R type. And you said some Mulliner? H.J. Mulliner. That's the, the coach builder. The coach builder, yes. They were a very high quality coach builder. And you were saying this is a daily driver. Well, it's, uh, I use it more than all the other cars. It explains why you got it here and not out at the yes, museum. I suppose. Yeah. A little harder to haul stuff out of there, but. It is. Yeah. Lovely car, and you said original interior. The only thing that's been done on is paint at one point. That's right, yeah. You've got the wide white walls. What a snappy looking car. Okay. And I can see you've got another hobby, building puzzles. Well, Dad, Dad was building puzzles. Oh, I see. So those are remnants from your, your dad keeping himself busy. Yes. Howard has stepped out for a moment, but look at this. Now, this isn't his car. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is like for early 80s Cadillac that somebody has shortened and added side mounts to. This is something, you know, they're probably trying to get that Excalibur sort of look. Um, it has been donated to the Leduc West Society, which is where he has his collection. And uh, I guess they're figuring out where it will have a home. But I this has not much to do with Howard, but it, it's stored here and it is a pretty wild thing that just it had to be shown on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and this yeah you said a 1923 ghost and that's a springfield silver ghost wow what a springfield massachusetts so who would have been the original owner of a car like oh, this oh i have the names of, of the uh owner and was he was a beer baron in in uh, the u.s and he had two cars and this one he used to 
go to the operas and the different things like that, chauffeur driven. And uh, what was his other car? I wonder. It was another Rolls Royce, but uh, I don't know what it was. I guess there's uh, money in the beer industry. <laughs> I would think so. Yes. Wow! Could you imagine? You're off to the opera with your wife or family or mistress. <laughs> And you've got this beautiful car to take you there. Yes, it, uh, it was uh, quite a photogenic car. Right? So this was in a museum for many years. Yes, the Tamrowski Museum. In, uh, I'm not sure where it was now, but when he died, the, his widow had an auction sale, and the fellow I bought it from was at the sale, and he bought it. So... And is this the original paint scheme? Are these the original colors for it? Yes, yes, it is always black. Burgundy, or I guess a leather hide for the uh, driver. Well, that's been replaced and that's not original. Because it got weathered because of the top, I think they replaced the front upholstery. And that's not the proper type. And eventually I'll change that. So when you see a car like this and you see the open, your traditional classic limousine, it looks from these um, uh, upholstery uh, attachment points here that there would be a canvas cover yes, or something. Yes, there was. Like. There was a, a canvas cover came in here and then there was uh, posts that came up here with uh, uh, material that you could see through. And so they give the uh, chauffeur some protection from the elements. But I think what a lot of people fail to remember is that this isn't long after horse and buggy, where your your driver, the, the coachman, would sit outside. Well, I guess that's where it came from. Yeah, it's probably there. Wow, what a, what a stunning vehicle. And uh, these are the usual steps to help get into the vehicle? Well, or... well, yes, that was a step, but it also held the battery. Okay. The battery was, that should sit a little better, but it, it was the battery. Yeah. Now, at one point, your collection was here in these garages and has since moved to a, a very proper setting. Yes. And I guess we're going to head over there. Yes, we are. We'll go over there in a short while. Okay. Well, I'm so glad to hear that this car is running and, and you brought it back to life, as yes. we should. It's, uh, every car I own now is run. So. Wow, look at that. Look at that engine. It's a work of art, really, isn't it? Well, Henry Royce was a perfectionist, and everything had to be just right. Like, it's just everything nicely polished, and, you know, you open that hood, and you really get an eyeful. And how nice that this is a working vehicle again, after all those years. Yes, after all those years. Well, let's head over to the museum and check it out. Okay. Before we head over to the uh, museum, he's got a project car on the go. It's a James Young bodied Phantom 5? Phantom 5, yes. With the quad headlamps, and you can see he's going through it and working on the mechanical, getting it running. Something special about the interior on this car. You were saying, Howard, the center console here, what would have been in that originally? This was made for a television set. Wow, the little portable TV set in there. That would have been pretty deluxe. It was. And then this is for the liquor cabinet. And I'm looking for the glasses and decanters for the... Uh... Probably a nice little crystal set went in there. Yes, yes. Wow. And then it has jump seats on there too. So we th we think of uh, onboard uh, entertainment system as being a new idea. But here we are in the 1960s and you've got onboard entertainment. <laughs> Footrests. Wow. And it's uh, the interior is immaculate. Yes, it was it's in great shape. redone quite a few years ago and never hardly used. You've got the divider glass here, but there's no yeah. slider. Oh, it's electric. It's electric, yeah. I was going to say, you must. What, what happens when you need to talk to your driver? But there, you've, <laughs> you've answered that question. Yes. Wow, it's gorgeous. What are we looking at here, Howard? This looks. This doesn't look like your average car. This is a 1952 Silver Wraith, built by Park Ward, and there were special features on this car that very few cars had. 
the uh, first owner wanted the body four inches wider than what Rolls-Royce or that park ward normally built. So the cowling is actually four inches narrower when you lift the hood up, but they wanted it this wide, so they had to make a new hood and uh, everything was four inches wider, the whole car. And I noticed the body has sort of this rattan or sort of... Um, yes, well, this is very special rattan uh, cane work, uh, bamboo. And I've only seen one or two cars like that. And uh, this car was restored in Ontario, but uh, a man in Edmonton owned it originally. Well, not originally. He had bought it in the U.S. And then it was sold to... Uh, one other person and then another friend of mine in the Rolls Royce Owners Club bought it and had it sent to uh, Ontario and had it totally restored from the ground up. And uh, there's a lot of money invested in this car. Wow, it's absolutely stunning with the rattan like that. You just really don't see that type of deal work, uh, detail work going on a, a modern car. One thing that this car, has, I've never seen on another car, but uh, I'm sure there is, uh, when you had to change the tire, you had to take the fender skirt off, but what did you do with the fender skirt? You had to lay it down somewhere. Well, Park Ward came up with an idea that is totally different. Wow, isn't that smart? And you never got the fender skirt dirty, and this model had, Park Ward had this on all of their cars with this style of coachwork. But it is very, very nice. It's smart, yeah, because for anybody who's had a fender skirt, oftentimes you're looking for a safe place to put it. That's right. And uh, this car has built-in features like uh, in the uh, doors, the driver's door, of course, he did, didn't drink or couldn't, but they had little table and they had... Uh, Is that mustard? You have Dijon? No, no, it's a seat. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, high a food. full street cleaner. Yes. I thought you were having a bit of a funny by keeping some mustard there in case somebody asked. And it's a left-hand drive. It's made for the U.S. It was a lady in the U.S. bought it originally. Unusual for an old Rolls almost. Almost. And the back is just gorgeous. Footrests, picnic tables, uh, wooden pools, and the wood is very nice. Now, how many cars were finished with rattan like this? Very few, very few. There was, uh, well, I've only maybe seen one, possibly two cars at a national meet like this. And we're standing here, and I'm being careful not to bump into what appears to be a, a Rolls Royce engine sitting here. Well, this is a Merlin engine. Oh, out of an aircraft. It's a uh, half of a V12, and the cylinders, well, you can see how huge this engine was. It would sit about this high when the uh, this is just the head just the just head. the head now that would have been in what a spitfire or yes spitfire and this is what the piston wow was. look at that it, it's huge and uh, this was uh, given to me and it, what it says on it is the rolls royce piston that powered the world famous spitfire hurricane fighters in world war ii Special limited edition number six. Wow, isn't that neat? This is a brand new piston. I see. It's, I mean, I'm just taking in all the, the artwork and the promotional dealer displays over there, like the uh, Spirit of Ecstasy, the giant statue, and everything is just, uh, you know, you are obviously more than a fan of this mark. It, it's been a lifelong passion. Well, yes, it has. It's become a lifelong passion. Wow. I, uh, Hadn't expected ever to own this many cars, but it's just one thing leads to another and all of a sudden you have another car. Well, Howard, what have we here? This oh. is absolutely stunning. You've got all the cars lined up in a row so nice. Welcome to Leduc West and the Hooper Building Collection. Yes, and I noticed from the outside of the building that you've replicated the, the Hooper factory. Yes, yeah, that was built in 1933, I think. 
34, and uh, I took every feature that I could out of the building picture to build this building. Does the original building still stand? No, no, it was torn down. So this is the last remnant, sort of. Yes, <laughs> You've replicated yes. it. Yeah, well, it this is great. So walk me through here. How did you decide to lay your collection out in the museum here? Well, I built the building so that it could do two things. And one was that we could have receptions like weddings and, and other kinds of functions in here. And that's why this was built with the walkway this way. But we put a tile floor down and uh, spaced it such that I could lay the cars out the way I wanted when we uh, used it as a car museum. So that's why it looks this way. Ah, okay. And easy to maintain, easy to clean? Yes, it is. Easy to clean. Uh, these are commercial tiles and uh, they're solid all the way through for the color so you could wear it out to nothing it would still look good so let's uh, let's walk and talk and we've got okay. the uh is there any particular reason why you laid things out the way you did here well the way i started was the oldest cars to the newest car oh i see okay but then i put this in this is going to go in the front but for now it's going to be here and what's going to go here, the Seraph? Yes, the Silver Seraph okay. for 1999. So this is a 53 R-type Bentley rolling chassis, the way it would have been shipped to the coach builder of your choice. So I could have any kind of body that you desired and put on this chassis. And did you do some restoration work to the chassis to make it look so nice? Basically, I put it together. A friend of mine had done all the restoration but it wasn't together so i bought it and installed everything that you see and you said you had the body for this car as well i have the body but it's rusty so not worth putting on no and i have another one right there the blue one right it's exactly the same as this one so other than the automatic transmission well i think it's neat to show people in a building that's replicating the factory how they would have delivered them originally that's what my intention was yeah well, that's yeah. great okay so let's start maybe with the oldest and work our way up to the sure. newest okay and i guess where would your where would your ghost sit amongst these well it would sit here right because it it's truly sit. the oldest right so this will be moved down but uh, this is the uh, oldest one here in the museum it's a 1929 20 horsepower, which was rebodied way back in the uh, 70s. And I have all the paperwork on it from the original or the owner at the time deciding how they're going to design the body. And he would supply all the drawings and the fittings. And then you decided on the coach builder. So, and they decided on a unique body style for this, didn't they? Yes. It's the boat tail. All right. A very neat car. Well, I think so. Oh, of course. Well, I imagine you wouldn't have bought it unless you thought so. <laughs> well, I hadn't planned on buying another car when this one came up. But when I saw it, I couldn't resist. I bought it on the spot when I saw it. Wow. And, and next to it, we have? This is a 1930 Phantom II. 140 GN is the serial number. And it was my first Rolls Royce. I bought that in April 28th, 1967. This is the one that you went and looked at and they checked it over and said it needed a muffler, but otherwise a good vehicle? Yes, yes. And I bought it on that strength. I never drove it, uh, never even sat in it really, but uh, here it is. And it's pretty well the same condition as I bought it in. It's been a very good car. The uh, fenders may have been repainted, but the body still has the original paint and in good sunlight you can actually see the brush marks very slight of how it was done in the old days yeah brush lacquer and polish right that's right many coats of lacquer wow so this would have been a, a younger version of you you must have thought this was quite an impressive car coming from uh you know chrysler's and plymouth's and things well i was only 24 when i bought this car so uh other people my age were buying new cars and i was buying old cars so this is my first Rolls Royce and uh, still have it. And it, it's the start of this whole collection. The one that started the whole thing. Yes. It gave you the bug. I guess so. And how many miles did you personally put on this car since you've owned it? I'd have to guess, but I'd say uh, eight, 10,000 miles. That's... I did drive it to the States uh, to a international antique car meet and uh, drove it all over 
Alberta. How did it do on the highway? Well, I was coming out of Edmonton one day and a neighbor was just trying to pass me and I took it up to 70 some miles an hour. Wow, that's pretty impressive for a 1930 vehicle. And it rides the same as when it was sold because it has leather gaiters and there's oil in there and you can pump oil in there. And so the springs are supple just like when you bought it Isn't as new. So it's a very nice uh, driving condition. And the, the next one over is the same year, but different model. Well, this is a Phantom One, but it's a Springfield Phantom One built in Springfield, Massachusetts. And this car is a 1930 also, but uh, it is rebodied. It was uh, sold as a limo at one time. And uh, in 1929 in the crash, it got sold for $1,000, and the new owner took it to Inskip and had this beautiful town car body put on it and uh, had it totally restored then when the next owner bought it and uh, took it all down and totally restored it, it ground up everything. So originally, would it have had a body similar to the your, your Phantom II? Or? I can't say for sure. Uh, uh, the American bodies were different. They had different coach builders. They were all uh, custom-built cars, so I can't say exactly what it had. I don't know. There's no record of what it had before. I don't have any photos of the car before, but the man that bought it, his dad actually restored it, and uh, it was very high quality. So uh, it's a good car. I bought it uh, a few years ago, and I haven't driven it very much, but it uh, runs very well and uh, goes quite well. Oh, and we're moving up six years in production here to the Phantom Three. You can see the body shape has changed a bit. Yes, it's more uh, streamlined, and uh, this car is one of about 710 Phantom Threes built. It was a Canadian original owner uh, in, I believe, Toronto, and then it went to the U.S., and then it came back again, and then a fella in Vancouver bought it and had it driven out to Vancouver, and then he had it restored over many years, and he moved to Victoria, and that's where I bought the car from him directly, and it's a good car. We drove it back home from Victoria, and... Uh, to drive a car this heavy and with uh, a V12, uh, it's quite something. Through the mountains? Through the mountains, up the Coquihalla. And uh, so, yes, it's it's quite the car. Must have been quite the drive. I'm sure it was a lot of fun. Well, I had a friend of mine fly out with me to uh, Victoria to pick up the car. And uh, we certainly enjoyed the car. And the owner was getting to the point where he couldn't drive it anymore. So he was reluctant to sell, but yet he needed to sell. And in fact, I went out uh, early in the year to buy the car and I looked at it and I, we made a deal. And I, on the way home, I got cold feet and I phoned him when I got home and said, I can't live with the price. Well, he said, I'm going to give it to my grandson in the States. And well, that was even worse. So. <laughs> Then uh, I talked to friends of mine that knew him, and they said, well, try again if you're comfortable now with the price. So I phoned him again and said, look, I'm happy with the price now. And he said, okay, after a pause. So that's when we went out and we uh, uh, brought the car home. Wow, well, it looks fantastic. So in fact, we had gone out earlier and uh, we came to the door and uh, he said, no, you can't have the car. Well, what happened now? Well, he said, there's an exhaust leak and I want that repaired first. So that's when we flew out uh, again and uh, we uh, bought the car and brought it home. I think what I love about you and your collection is that you've used and driven most of these vehicles. Yes, I've driven them all except uh, the first one. I actually haven't driven it much at all just from home to the museum. But uh, we plan on having a, 
a couple of days here with the cars, and we're going to drive them all. We'll take them all out and exercise them some and uh, put them back in. So out of all the vehicles that are here, and I know it's like saying, which is your favorite kid, but do you have one that's at the museum here that uh, you're most fond of or have a, the most interesting story attached to? Well, I suppose my first one. That That's the car that I started with, and I've had the most time in that car. I've driven the most miles with it. And that would be the car, I guess, if I have to choose one. But they all are different. They all have a personality. And it's, it's just... Uh, each one has its own quirks and uh, things that are special about the car. So what was it like being a 24-year-old in Alberta, pulling up to a gas station at that time, driving a 1920s Rolls-Royce? <laughs> well, it was uh, quite a... Uh, <laughs> I remember when I took the car to where I worked at Massey Ferguson in Leduc the very first time, and there were people coming by and even measuring the wheelbase, one fellow carpenter, he got his tape measure out, and we were being interrupted uh, quite a bit, and the boss said, you know, we can't get any work done. Please park it in behind the building. So that was the attraction uh, in Leduc at that time in 1967. So, yeah, it was uh, a young fella driving a, a beautiful old Rolls Royce, and uh, I had not expected that to happen at all. I didn't have the money to buy the car, but I went to the bank and uh, talked to the manager and he said, well, I'd like to see the car, which was something I hadn't expected. So uh, we met at the garage where the car sat and the uh, bank manager was going to get in the car and the uh, brother that was showing the car for his brother said, well, nobody's got in the car without taking their shoes off. So my bank manager sat on the floor of the car with his feet in the running board and took his shoes off and got in and looked around some and felt things and said, you come and see me. So I went to see him a few days later in Leduc and he said, we will loan you the whole amount of the car. And the reason for that was that we said, well, we were collecting early Canadiana and we would sell everything to pay for the car. So that's what happened. We sold everything and put the money to the bank and paid the car and then I paid mom and dad off. So that's how I came to get the car. And good support of mom and dad getting oh, you going yes. with your first classic. Oh, yes. Yeah, very much. Now, this is also, well, just a minute. Yeah, it's a 1936. Uh, this is a 1936 Phantom Three that was on the Peking to Paris run, and it was done in 2010, and it made the tour. Uh, some of the cars didn't get, a, get the whole tour because they broke down, but... This one was uh, really prepared well, and it made the whole tour right across. And so it was donated to the Duke West. This car belongs to the Duke West Antique Society. And uh, it's on display here for people to come and look at. I noticed the, the side mount on the other side has a bit of damage. Is there a story behind that? Yes, it got broken, I understand, through the desert, uh, somewhere along the tour. And I left it on the car. I thought that's a very, uh, shows what kind of conditions it went through to break a wire wheel that heavy. And, uh, but the rest stood up okay. It's a good thing they had the side mounts with them. Well, he was quite prepared. There's all kinds of extra things in this car to make sure that it would make it across. I never thought it would when he told me he wanted to take this car across. But by gosh, uh, they prepared it very well. So it made it across and then he donated it to the Duke West. Now I was asking amongst all the cars here, which is one that you'd really want to talk about? And you pointed at this, it's a 39 Wraith. Wraith. They only built 491 of these cars before the war. And this is one of two cars in the world with this body style. And uh, it's built by Mulliners of Birmingham, which was a smaller company but built very high quality bodies for various companies, but they wanted to get the business from Rolls-Royce to build, uh, uh, be recommended to have bodies built by them. So they went to extreme, uh, well, they, they, they built this car beyond what they normally do. And I'll show you why.
This has quarter sawn wood in the veneers in the whole car. So what that means, they take a piece of nice figured walnut and they cut it in four pieces and then rearrange it so that there's a pattern all the way around. And you can see the cuts, quarter sawn. And everything is done even behind the picnic tables. And the whole car is quarter sawn wood. So if you look at the, uh, there you can see that everything matches from side to side. So, and starting from the front of the car, everything is like book wood. This matches that side. So that was one of the things that they did. Plus, on here you see solid wood, plus inlaid wood, plus quarter sawn there, and veneer here, and it's matched from the center out, and it matches there. The time to do that is, is just, well, it, it, I don't know how long it took the car I, to be built. I don't have those uh, sheets, but anyway, this is very special car. What is the little device I see on the back over there, the chrome? Oh, that is the uh, speaker from the uh, chauffeur to the... Uh, uh, people in the back. They could talk to the chauffeur through that. Well, isn't that something? So they had their own little telecom system yeah, when the divider did. was up. Yeah. And it has a sunroof in the back. Uh, the other car, the owner's car, this was the wife's car of the owner of the company. He had this sunroof in the front, but she wanted it in the back. So they built it this way. And so uh, it has a convex mirror in 1939. Most cars never had convex mirrors in 1939. No, I see that. It's a little bit of a curve to it, so you have a better field of vision. Yes, very, very good. Now, what is the um, the technical term for the razor back or the shear? This is shear line, yes. The fenders are not curved like a normal fender. They're cut off just like a razor. You cut the whole side of the fenders off. So uh, this is a shear line style. And that continues on to the back of the vehicle as well. Yes, the fenders, very elegant feel to the fenders, and it sweeps around. Uh, it's very good, very nice. Have you driven this car much? Oh, yes, uh, I've driven this car quite a bit. It's a good car, it starts and runs well. It has the first model to have independent front suspension along with the Phantom 3. The Phantom 3 and the Wraith had independent front suspension for the first time. So uh, it's, uh, it rides beautiful. Uh, I've had it to British Columbia, to a Rolls Royce meet. Uh, it, it works very well. It has all the tools and a special hammer that uh, is used to knock off the wire wheel. Or, well, it's a steel wheel, but it's got a, a hubcap that comes off. And that's all that holds that wheel on, but it's a splined uh, hub and it goes up against a camfered uh, backing and one nut holds it on. Wow, so that one of your favorites? Yes, it is, yes it is. And the restoration was done prior to your purchase? Yes, this is the way I bought it. The engine was overhauled and it was repainted. And uh, the only thing I did, I replaced the leather in the front exactly with the original type leather and uh, had it uh, made uh, the way it was supposed to be. So, yeah, no, the, everything is, even the armrest, there wasn't one on the driver's side, which it didn't come with one, but I thought it should have one. So I took the original leather and made another uh, armrest and had it upholstered and made it to fit this side. Quite handy of you. Well, I just, this has another feature, which uh, most people don't know. It has, look at they, that. They call a chauffeur's window. So instead of cranking it down, we just went like that and it was gone. I wonder why they got rid of that. That seems. Well, it's four mechanism things to get wrong. You notice the door handles are inside the door. It's very, uh, I've never seen a car like this before with the door handle in like that. And these crank out, so. And the door post is very narrow. If you look at the door post here, 
it's very narrow. Very, very. That's maybe what uh, half an inch. Yeah, it's not much. And then this is angled yet so that it fits just right in. So it's very narrow. Very delicate. And yet the the shut lines and the way the quality, the way it closes is still oh, so yes. nice. Everything fits very well. This is a, a wooden body, but uh, everything is, no, there's no rot in this car. Uh, no, it's very nice. This is a 2025 and it's uh, totally restored many years ago. I bought it in uh, BC and drove it home. It's a very nice car. It's, I like the lines of it, the style. It's a Hooper body also. That's a Hooper body. And this one is a Windovers limousine 2530. Much and taller roof line on it. Sorry? Much uh, taller roof line. Oh, yes, yes. It was a limousine, so it was taller for easier access. And uh, this car is uh, pretty well original. And it drives well, and I'd go anywhere with this car. And the 2530 is the largest of the small horsepower cars. This is an all-steel body made totally by Rolls-Royce. It's their first model. The Mark VI and the uh, Silver Dawn were very similar. And it's an all-steel body. And Rolls-Royce sold the car complete. It wasn't coach built. And uh, this one is a Silver Wraith, 1953, with also Hooper coachwork on it. And it was owned by the Amir of Bahawalpur in India. And those are the traditional Indian colors. So it has quite a history of how it got to Canada and how I acquired it, but that's another story altogether. This is an R-type Bentley and this has automatic transmission in it and it's left-hand drive and it's very similar to the uh, rolling chassis so you can see the complete body and one without the body so it's a very nice car it's a canadian car it's one of 12 that were sold new in canada this is the silver shadow and that was a car that came after the silver cloud which you saw earlier and uh, they were the most popular car for Rolls-Royce. They sold more of these cars than any other car until this time. And then they went to the Camargue. They, had a, they wanted something totally different, so they hired Pin and Farina to design a, a body that would fit on the shadow platform. So uh, it's the only car that had a slanted grille so many degrees forward and it's a two-door car and it has uh, Nuella leather which is very soft leather and it's a very nice car it drives well I've driven it to BC to the meets there and uh, I like that car and then after the shadow came the silver spirit and silver spur this is a long wheelbase so it's called a silver spur and this is a 1984 with square headlights uh, the later versions had uh, a whole cover on there that was European, but uh, they were accepted then, I guess, in, in North America. But the square headlights had to be when they came in. So that rounds up my collection. Well, absolutely stunning. And I guess the question is, are you done collecting or are you still going to add more? I think I'm pretty well done. The Phantom Five was the uh, crowning end or completion of my collection. The only other one is the Phantom 4, which is beyond me. But the Phantom 5, I have every model now from Silver Ghost to uh, Silver Sarah that were made by Rolls-Royce. Well, thank you for having us out to your home and to your lovely collection out here. And if uh, folks want to come out and view this collection, how do they come see it in person? Well, we haven't had a grant. <clears throat> We haven't had a grand opening yet. Uh, we were going to have one two and a half years ago, but then COVID came. And so now it may not happen for a while yet. We're not sure just when. Uh, in order to have a, a grand opening, we need to be open then too. So it means hiring staff and the museum in at Leduc West have to be open. So until that happens, I can't tell you when we're going to have a grand opening. So stay tuned. Yes, stay tuned.
would you tell a young person, maybe a, a young kid who's just kind of eyeing up an old car, or thinking about collecting something, what words of wisdom or advice would you give to a, a novice or young collector? Oh, that's, that's pretty hard to define for me. I, I would say join an antique car club or join a club dedicated to the car that you're interested in and get to know some of the people and maybe help on the cars and get going that way.